the Word of God. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, as well as a couple of other areas in the New Testament and the Old Testament. But you all have this little flyer. It's, it's Genesis 1, 2, and 3, points of focus. And there's about two dozen points of focus. What I'm hoping that you will all do is maybe when you get home for the next couple months, maybe every other day or once a week, read, sit down and read the three chapters of Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in one sitting. <clears throat> and each time you get to one of these points, just remember it. And so what happens is you remember all these points through the three chapters of Genesis, and you'll see how important they are. And what we'll find is we read through the three, uh, three chapters of Genesis, everything we want to know or need to know about this world is in those three chapters. In those three little chapters, how everything begins in the history of God, it's a history of God's salvation is what it is. And it begins in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And, and it's an amazing thing. So use that chart as you, maybe during the week and... Um, Maybe 10 times in the next month or so, read through those three chapters with those little notes, and you will see those important points in those three chapters. In Genesis 1, 1, probably one of the most important verses in the Bible. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I know we lose it a little bit in translation because it's written in Hebrew. Now, the Hebrew language is a little different. In, in Hebrew, that's, there's seven words. In that first verse, seven Hebrew words. And I think seven's important, wouldn't you say? Perfection. Seven is the number of perfection. So the very first wor verse has seven words in Hebrew. There's no evolution. There's no things just kind of popped in by themselves. No, God is over all things. And what it really means is God is the beginning of all things. Everything started, everything except God, of course. The, the creation started with God, and he is... Uh, he created heavens and the earth. It's like saying the A to the Z, the Alpha and the Omega. Nothing exists outside of, of, of those parameters that's natural. It's all in there. And so if we really think about Genesis 1-1, it's so important because Genesis 1-1 starts everything out about God's history of salvation. And then what happens the rest of Genesis chapter 1 is we get an orderly explanation of what that first verse meant. And so really if you think about it, when you read chapter 1 of Genesis, how is God going to explain creation? Is he gonna, it would take an eternity for him to go through all the details about every little thing. Scientists will study for years all their lives and they're still discovering new things. So what God has done is given, he has given an orderly explanation of what we need to know about what is important about his creation. And it's in chapter 1. So chapter 1 of Genesis verse 2 says this. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over it. So really that term formless and empty is in Hebrew. It's tohu and bohu. It's kind of like we say willy-nilly. Helter-skelter. In other words, there's chaos. Everything's just mixed. And then it says darkness was over the face of the deep. In other words, it's just darkness. There's no order yet. There, it's in the dark. But then a very important, a third little point in verse 2 is this. The Spirit of God was hovering over. The Spirit of God is not under. The Spirit of God is not within. The Spirit of God is sovereign over everything, and he's looking down at all of this. That's what we should understand about verse 2. Then verse 3 says this. Then God said, that's so important. When God speaks, something's going to happen. He's sovereign. God said, let there be light. The light didn't go, oh, I don't know, I don't know. No, there was light, and that's a miracle. God spoke order into the chaos, and that's what he does. In fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you all realize this, God still does that today. The chaos of this world, God can speak order into the chaos if anyone will just bow to him through Jesus Christ. But I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. We're still in chapter 1. Let there be light, and boom, there was light. Wow. Now we'll skip down to verse 4. God saw the light. And he's going to make an assessment for our attention so we understand something about the light. God saw the light. Oh, there it is. And it was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. So God brought the light and the goodness out of the chaos. And God is sovereign over all. And it's all good. Verse 5 then. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. 
There was evening, there was morning, the first day. Now, in the, in the Bible, in the culture, whoever names something is the one in charge. You get to name it, then you're in charge. And that's kind of a sign here. God is naming things. He's in charge. He repeatedly then called everything good. He's naming it good. Everything is good. Now we'll jump down to verse 24. We'll get to the sixth day. God said, let the land produce living creatures. Now don't miss this. According to their kinds. And that's repeated about five times. According to its kind. According to its kind. These animals are representing what animals are. Their kinds. Then verse 26 says something amazing. Then let us make man in our image, our kind. We have a whole different kind here. We're not like the animals. We have a different kind. We are representations of God according to his likeness. So the image of God in humanity is not the same as the image of the animals. We can love animals all we want, but they don't have the image of God in them. We do. Humans do. It says it right in God's word. How valuable is that image of God in humanity? How valuable is human life? Just to get a little sample of this, we'll go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, where after Noah's flood, God's starting to let the world populate again. And he has to give them some instructions. And here's what he says in Genesis 9, verse 4. You must not eat the meat that has a lifeblood still in it. So God is claiming blood as a symbol as a sign, and it's going to be holy, particularly for the Israelites, as we'll find out later. But right now, no one understands it. It's back in Noah's day. But God is claiming blood as a representation of what human life is, the blood. So he says this, You must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. For, and for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. In other words, there's going to be an accounting if somebody messes with the human beings and their life. The sign is the blood, the lifeblood. I will demand an accounting for, for every animal and for each man. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. Now, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. In other words, God's going to put justice in this world about anyone that takes another person's life unjustly. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man, his blood will be shed. And here's the reason. For in the image of God... Has God made man? So it's kind of repeated here what was going on in Genesis chapter 1, how powerful the image of humanity is. We have to understand that. So we are a super, we are a separate kind. We are a holy kind. We are in the image of God, humanity. And this reality of morality is all through humanity. Everybody knows this. They may not admit it, and there's criminals that don't like it, but it's true. And I like to call it the R.A. factor. The R.A. factor. Responsibility and accountability. It's everywhere. We are responsible to, to God, and we are accountable to God. We are responsible to the government's and we're accountable to governments. This whole idea of justice and accountability is a reality of human nature. It, God put it there. It's everywhere. Now we'll get down to verse, and we'll repeat that again in a couple of times, but let's get down to verse 26 then. Then God, uh, it says this, And let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So part of the reflection of the image of God in us is God has put humans on earth to rule. God, we're, we're, we represent God, how we rule on this earth. So the RA factor is a reality. We are responsible to God how we do things, and we're going to be accountable, accountable to God for how we do things. There's no escape. Then verse 27 says this. The first poem, you could say, in the Hebrew scripture, and poetry doesn't mean it rhymes. It just means they, they remove certain words, and it makes it shorter, and people would realize in that culture, this is, this is poetry, figurative language. It says this, and there will also be repetition in poetry. Verse 27, so God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. So we have this word, this powerful word, created three times on purpose. This is God's doing. And then in the, in the end of this, it says, wait a minute, there's male and female. Something's going on here. I don't think there's gender confusion at all with God. There's just male and female. 
the binary. The pe people don't like the fact there's only two, but it's a reality. Now, we can rebel all we want, but the truth is there's only male and female. Now we get to end of Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> we get a summary statement, the end of Genesis 1, verse 31. God's going to summarize it. He's, he looked at everything that he has created, and he called it very good. Remember before, it's just good, good, good. Now, very good, verse 31. That's an attention getter on purpose. God is pronouncing everything that he has created very good. His personal assessment. All humanity should understand this. God's original creation was very good. Then it says there was evening, that was morning, the sixth day. Now we're going to move to Genesis chapter 2. Now what happens in Genesis 2 is we get a completely different perspective. Genesis 2 is written on purpose for a reason, and we will see how that works. Because we're moving on forward through God's perfect, completed creation. So Genesis 2.1 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move into the seventh day. We had the six days in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1. Now we're moving to the seventh day. So verse 2 says this, By the seventh day God had finished. By the seventh day God had finished. In other words, he's completed the work he had been doing. On the seventh day he rested. He rested. We should underline that word. He rested from all the work. In verse 3, God blessed the seventh day. So he, he rested and he blessed. I mean, it's a, it's a blessing of a rest. In other words, he doesn't need to do anything. It's complete. Th verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. He set apart that seventh day as a commemoration of his completed work. The seventh day. It's called the Sabbath rest. In fact, that word in Hebrew actually is Shabbat, Sabbath. He rested, he Shabbat from all his work. He, he blessed that day and made it holy because he had Shabbat from all the work of creating he had done. So that seventh day is a holy blessing of God's commemoration of his finished work. It's done. Now that Sabbath rest was not just on one day a week. It was every day. The, Adam and Eve lived under the, the, the covering of God's completed, finished work. 24-7 forever. Because the work's finalized. It's completed. There's nothing more to do. So they're living under God's completed work. It's something we should never forget because it's so prophetic. That's why we need to really understand what's in Genesis chapter 2. All is at rest. God's work is complete. And it's called paradise. Can we say that word? And we try to make our own paradise on earth, right? But God had paradise. All is under his rest. So Genesis 1.1, we get a grand, the first verse, we get a grand seven-word statement in Hebrew about in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Then chapter 1, then we get all the way to cha chapter 2, verse 3, an orderly explanation of the seven days. Then something very special happens in Genesis 2.4, verse 4. Don't miss this in your Bible. It starts out by this little phrase. This is the account. Now what's happening here is the writer, people who write literature are allowed to write the way they want. And when whoever wrote this did not have chapter numbers. But they had divisions like this, this little phrase. This is the account. He's starting a whole new account of creation, but from a different point of view. So it has this word. In Hebrew, it's one word, toledot, which means this is the account. And there'll be five Toledots in the first uh, half of Genesis, 1 through 11. And then there'll be five Toledots at the middle of chapter 11 to the end of the chapter 50. So there's 10 Toledots, and they do that on purpose. Two fives. Those Toledots bring a, a complete a new perspective. And here's what it says in verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Uh, so now what, what happens is it says in verse 4 this. When the Lord God, notice that the new name of, the, of God is added there, all capitals, correct? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and most of us understand that's Yahweh. That's the covenant name. God only uses that covenant name when there's a covenant involved with his people. So in chapter 1, we just had Elohim. God, 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 because he's sovereign over everything, sovereign over everything. But now something is shifting, a new point of view. Elohim uh, 
Yahweh Elohim, God is, is going to introduce a covenant now in chapter 2. From a different point of view, we're going to see creation. Chapter 2 is so important. We should not miss this. The focus of chapter 2 is not on creation as much as it is on the covenant in creation. Now, I know skeptics, if you read a skeptic's book, I always say everybody should at least read one. Because it, it increases your faith when you see how they talk about stuff. Well, they, they'll argue constantly about how Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 contradict each other. Different order, different. See, the Bible's no good, and they throw the whole Bible out. No, that's not true at all. It's a completely different perspective, literally on purpose. From literature, that's how literature works. So we can see that the covenant is the central feature in chapter 2. It didn't even exist in chapter 1. <clears throat> so the covenant is in the middle of all things in chapter 2. I know I've repeated that several times, but we can't miss this. So here's what it says in verse 7. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life. God breathed his own ruah, the Holy Spirit, into, the, into humanity. God breathed his life into us. No wonder we're made in the image of God. And the man became a living being. Wow. God's breath in us. Now we're going to enter into the central core of chapter 2, verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man that he had formed. Remember, this is all God's doing, and it's done on purpose, so we'll notice something. Verse 9. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Trees everywhere. But look what happens in the middle of the garden to get our attention. It's in the middle. In the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you think this was done on accident? If the Bible says and God's word says something's done in the middle, do you think it's important? It's an attention getter. It's, no one puts trees in the middle of their house, in the middle of everything. It's always on the outside. But these two trees represent God's reality, the RA factor, responsible to God and accountable to God. Those trees represent that. We will see. And really what it is is a covenant, a king-servant covenant. God is king. As long as you do what God the king says, you will be blessed. But if you don't do what he says, you'll be under a curse. And we have those contracts everywhere, blessing and cursings from contracts. And they're normal rules and regulations. This is a rule and regulation over all of creation. So verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. There's freedom in this contract, this covenant. Now verse 17, he says something very important. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. In other words, they have freedom as long as they obey. The RA factor, responsibility in accountability before God. It's the central issue. As long as they obey, they'll enjoy the tree of life. That's what that tree stands for, that they're obeying. The other tree stands for disobedience, and that's what it stands for. Now, there's no such thing as absolute freedom. Now, I know in our world we have libertarians, and uh, you know, I, I like them and everything. I have nothing against them. But, but they sometimes get on the news and stuff and talk about libertarianism, and it can't be true. <laughs> Because they got stuff they don't want people to do. We have laws and regulations. Not, no one is absolutely free. It's insanity. And I always use this as, as an example. A train is free to be a train so long as it stays on the tracks. Doesn't that make sense? It can be a, the beautiful train, most beautiful train in the world. But if it wants to be free from the tracks, what happens? A train wreck. And that's the same way with humanity. God has put tracks down for humanity. And he's put it here in Genesis 2. As long as we stay on the tracks... We're going to be fine. So stay away from that tree, what that tree represents. What that tree represents is I'm going to decide what is right and wrong, not God. You're getting off the tracks, and that's what happens. So God has essentially set boundaries of freedom for humanity. When you come to the Lord, he puts those boundaries back in our lives, doesn't he? Aren't you glad those are there? They set us free, and they're, they're his boundaries, and it's a beautiful thing. To be without the boundaries, we will see the chaos that we see all around us. They don't have the boundaries, but God will put it back for anyone. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here on what's going on. But. 
So, so Genesis 2.18. All of a sudden, out of all this good creation, look what God says in Genesis 2.18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. No, something not good in God's very good creation gives us an example of how important what he's now going to say is. Something is not good. It's not good for man to be alone. <clears throat> I shall make a helper suitable for him. So God is really digging into the deep part of humanity to show really what we need. And so really what's happening here is Adam starts naming all the animals. Remember, it's the person that names is in charge. So he's naming all the animals. And uh, God realizes, hey, Adam needs a little help out there. So we get in verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the ribs and cl closed up the place with flesh. Verse 22, and the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Verse 23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she's been taken out of man. This oneness, this mir miraculous oneness is a prefiguration that goes into the future, which we'll look at in a minute. But this oneness is a miracle, and God has it represented in marriage, in oneness. They are joined together. It's very prophetic. So verse 24, <clears throat> for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. In other words, they're no longer under the authority of the father and mother. They're going to be their own authority. That's what's happening here. The man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The miracle of oneness in this marriage. It's a sacred, holy union. Now, I think our world has redefined God's definition of marriage. And once you redefine anything that God puts out there, it's, it's just not going to be one thing that's going to happen. It's, going to, it's, like, it's like stepping stones that lead to a platform. We get to that platform, then all the stepping stones disappear. How do we get here? Then they put more stepping stones to another platform. Then all the stepping stones disappear, and it keeps moving. How do we ever get here? We'll all begin with redefining marriage. It hasn't stopped there, has it? It's going to keep moving forward. The definition of marriage is extremely prophetic because it points to a oneness that is a miracle. I want to look at that miracle because I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but go all the way to the book of Revelation chapter 19. This is the end of the age. Revelation 19 is the end of the age. And look at, look at what happens at the end of the age. And we'll understand this when we get to Genesis 3, why this is here. But in Revelation 19, verse 6, the second coming of Christ is bringing a miracle oneness back to God's creation. And here it is. Revelation 19, 6. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like the loud peal of thunder, shouting hallelujah, which means praise you all the Lord, Yahweh. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding, the joining together, the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride? The church. That's not a wedding normally. like It's a supernatural oneness that we have. And wedding was a representation of that oneness. Fine linen, bright and clean were given her to wear. In other words, we've been cleansed by the Lord. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then verse 9. When the angel said to me, write, blessed are those, that's you and me, anyone in Christ, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We are joined with, we're going to be joined with Jesus in a way that's supernatural. We already are joined with him now. But there's going to be a supernatural end of the age wedding. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. So there we have it. Now we go all the way back to, to Genesis. We'll, we'll understand the importance of this wedding, this marriage. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks of marriage and he says, he's talking about marriage and all of a sudden he stops in verse uh, 32 in Ephesians 5 and he says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and his church. That we're the church and we're going to be supernaturally, one with Jesus, all of us. It's a wedding. 
So we need the miracle of this, of a revival in the United States of America to understand what's going on here. <clears throat> We're on image of God alert. We need the, the value of the meaning of life. We're destroying that all around us, the meaning of life. And we need, to, to, we need a resurrection of the value of the meaning of marriage. Just to give a little example of how this happens, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but after Genesis 3, the fall, we'll be looking at that in a moment. But Genesis 4, Cain murders Abel. In other words, uh, the, the, the meaning of life is suddenly dissolved in Genesis 4, and God even went to uh, Cain in person and tried to talk him out of it. But Cain, no, he murders his brother, chapter 4. And then right the very next thing is Lamech, uh, boasts about marrying multiple women. In other words, so we have the life messed up in Genesis uh, 4, and we have the definition of marriage messed up in Genesis 4, and that's going to spread all over this world. So now back to Genesis 2, verse 25. The man and his wife were naked, and they felt no shame. Now, we don't want to let this term naked throw us off because I remember being a little kid and my neighbors across the way invited me to church a number of times. I was just a little kid and I'd go. So I started reading the Bible like they told me and I got to Genesis 1. And I, when I got to this part, I, as a kid, I couldn't understand it. What's, what's this mean? And it kind of blew me away and I kind of quit reading the Bible. So we, we don't want to lose really what this means. It means they didn't need a covering. God is their covering. That's what it means. In other words, they don't need to cover themselves. God is their covering. It's a miracle. And it was called paradise. God's covering. Isn't that great? That's, that's really what this means. So God's creation began in paradise by God's own account. And it was very good. He assessed it as very good. God had them covered. So Genesis 1, we have God's created order. Genesis 2, we have God's covenant. The covenant is in Genesis 2. Then Genesis 3, we have that covenant dissolved. And so we have to put on our seatbelts and uh, hold on to ourselves as we go through Genesis 3 a little slowly. I'm going to actually open this Bible here and start. Because Genesis 3 is so important to understand everything that's going on. Genesis 3 then, 1 through 5, says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Because, you know, snakes crawl around and people don't yet see them and they hide. But the, the serpent represents another being that's very crafty. That's kind of what's going on here. And the serpent said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but not, uh, but not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die verse 4 you will not surely die the serpent said to the woman for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil there's the three lies of Satan that are still alive today in fact those three lies of Satan are in every false religion if I can use that term that we have on earth. Did God really say, doubting God's word? They don't want God's word. You will not die doubting God's justice. And then you'll be like God, doubting reality. You're not going to be like God at all. Those are three lies that are everywhere today. Now I'll go to verse 6. Now when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. You know, Adam was right there the whole time. We don't hear about it. He's standing right there. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. They lost their covering. That's what happened here. They lost their covering. And they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Adam and Eve ate from that forbidden tree. In other words, they did what they should not have done. They disobeyed God. And they're going to declare what is right and wrong, not God. And they lost their covering. Remember, they weren't dumb. They're, they're, they were, God put them in charge under his authority. Now their eyes are open. <clears throat> so they lost their covering. They made their own covering. <clears throat> 
It's natural. Don't human beings do that today? We will cover ourselves. We'll figure it out. We've got it all figured out. I call it the G3 syndrome, the, the G3 fig leaf syndrome. We will cover our, and our fig leaves are going to work. That pattern is all over the world. We can't help it. It's natural. Every human does it. Now I'll go to verse 8. Then the man said to his wife, <clears throat> excuse me, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? So they're, they're hiding from God. Did their coverings work? They didn't work. Now, most of us understand that, but everybody needs to understand that. That's in Genesis chapter 3. And God's first words to the first sinners, and he still calls this out today, where are you? Where are you? He never had to say that before because the relationship was one, wasn't it? He never had to say, where are you? And he's still saying that today. It's not that he didn't know where they were. It's so, first of all, they know something's up, and we know something's up. Because God obviously knows everything that's going on. So we should understand that relationship is broken and God has to say, where are you? They're lost. Now verse 10. So Adam answers, well, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, well, who, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 12, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some food and for the tree and I ate it. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, well, what is this you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See, Adam admitted he lost his covering, didn't he? They knew it. Otherwise, why would they cover themselves? They know they can't stand before God anymore, so they cover themselves. The whole world's doing that. So verse 10, Adam admits he lost his covering. Verse 11, God refers back to the covenant in chapter 2. Don't partake of that tree. Then in chapter 12, something amazing happens. I'm sure we all understand this. Adam blames God. Didn't he? The woman you gave me, and he blames the woman. The blame game. Don't we do that everywhere? Everybody blames something else. And then the woman blames the serpent. So we have the RA factor dead. There's no responsibility and there's no accountability, at least from the human perspective. Oh, well, there's still responsibility and accountability from God's perspective, or he wouldn't even be there asking them questions to reveal that they're lost. Responsibility and accountability is the number one environmental problem on earth today. And it's so huge, you'll never hear it mentioned. And it's that four-letter word called sin. It's a four-letter word of this world because you can't mention it. It's a cuss word. But sin has caused it all, hasn't it? You won't hear it mentioned. And it's sin that is killing us. Is that true in this world? Now, what a, it's a pandemic, isn't it? What if our country shut down because of that pandemic of sin? And made everyone go to the Lord. Wouldn't that, what a miracle. We wouldn't need the laws. We, half the laws would go. Half the problems would go. It'd be paradise. He's done that in our hearts already, hasn't he? If you've given your life to the Lord, you have the RA factor right back. You're, you're responsible and accountable to him. And he will bring correction constantly. You're alive. So that pandemic, which is entire creation, that pandemic is alive and the world can't mention it. Go to verse 14 then. God's going to bring judgment. In other words, reality, justice. Verse 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. He's lowering him down. He's lowering his status to be in the dust. This, we'll, we'll keep moving on. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Enmity, in other words, warfare, trouble. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So God pronounced judgment on Satan. Obviously, this serpent 
is not really a snake, correct? It's just a, a, a poetic word to use. This is what Satan's like. He crawls around like a serpent under the radar and no one knows about it. He's not a serpent. He's like a serpent. When we read the rest of the Bible, I'm sure we understand that uh, very much. He's a liar. He's a truth attacker. And he spreads lies. He is the accuser. And that's what Satan really means in Hebrew, the accuser. And he wants to accuse everybody. And he wants to confuse right and wrong. That's what he wants to do. And then he's also the deceiver. He attacks God's truth. So we can be our own gods, so to speak. And so Satan is called by uh, Jesus. Satan calls him the liar and the father of lies. In other words, he, he instituted lies into God's good creation. He's the father. He's, he's the liar and the father of lies. Don't we still see that today a little bit? A little bit of lying and deceitfulness going on in our culture and our media that mediates the truth for us. Jesus also said he only has one purpose, to kill, steal, and destroy. And we see it all over the world. Here's how Satan is described at the end of the age. Revelation 12, verse 9. That great dragon was hurled down. Now, he's not a dragon, but he's like a dragon, right? He's, he's a warrior. He's just, he's, his tail is whipping the whole world crazy. He's like a dr giant dragon. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent, which you just mentioned in Genesis 3, called the devil who leads the whole world astray. So if you're not following Jesus, you're following Satan. You can't help it. He leads the whole world astray. So Genesis 2, that covenant is a king-servant covenant in Genesis 2. And all creation is under, still today, under that covenant. Unless you get into a new covenant, which I'm getting ahead of myself. If you get into a new covenant, you're released from that covenant in Genesis 2. But we have something very amazing in Genesis 3.15, we have the gospel hidden in that little verse, Genesis 3.15. God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. It doesn't mean Satan's going to give birth. It means there'll be people that will be like Satan, his offspring. It's using figurative language. And there'll be people who, who will be followers of God. They'll be like his offspring. So you have two different types of people. It starts right in Genesis 4. Two lines. Jacob, uh, or I forgot the two names of the, the two gentlemen. And, uh, uh, anyway, there will be a constant spiritual battle on this earth after Genesis 3. No wonder our nation made In God We Trust our national motto in the early 1950s. We're not going to be like the other nations. Don't we wish we'd come back to that motto again? So here's what it says. <clears throat> I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He, the offspring, uh, God's offspring, will crush your head. In other words, you'll be defeated. You'll be completely defeated, but you'll just wound him. That's Jesus. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's the offspring of the woman, right? Born of a virgin, Jesus so uh, in the middle of this covenant curse, before any human history even is there, God gives the gospel. Genesis 3, 15. But the covenant curse is going to continue. We're still in it. The world has fallen. We live in paradise lost. Now back to Genesis 3, verse 16. <clears throat> to the woman, God said this. I will greatly increase the pains in childbearing, and with your pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, now I have to stop for a minute in case anyone, you know, the, the, anyone gets upset about that. Once the gospel enters in, this becomes a good thing, actually. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. But anyway, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. We live on a cursed creation right now. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. In other words, you've just left paradise. Now you're stuck with this stuff out here. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. 
By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food and th- until you return to the ground. It's interesting that the ground in Hebrew actually means Adam, Adama. And Adam is called Adam. He comes from the ground, the dust. You're going to return to where you came from. Since you, that's from where you were taken, that from dust you are and dust you will return. Now verse 20. So Adam named his wife. He's in charge. He named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living things. So this is the curse that comes upon any king-servant covenant. We have those covenants today. You sign an agreement. If you, did, if you break the, uh, what you're signed for, you're going to have a penalty. We have, a, we have rules and regulations everywhere. This is a rule and regulation over all creation. The king-servant covenant. Now I want to read verse 21 very slowly. Verse 21. <clears throat> the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. We should never forget verse 21. It's so important. Right in the middle of this chaos, number one, God removed man-made covering. You can't cover yourselves. Those fig leaves are not going to work. And and really, it's a picture of religions all over the world. Everyone is going to... Religion means to re-ligature, to re-tie. I'm going to re-tie myself to God somehow. Re-ligature. It doesn't work. Fig leaves won't work. So God removed their coverings. The second thing then, God covered them. But look what he covered them with, animal skins. Now we're not told all the details about this early in, it's only chapter 3 of Genesis, but it really, it stands for justice. Blood, there has to be a blood price. Remember how blood stood for life back in Genesis 9, we read a little while ago? So the blood price has to be paid. And God knows this, it's a prophetic picture of what will happen in the future. There will be a price paid, and it will be Jesus himself. He'll pay the ultimate price. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the reality of justice is in human nature, isn't it? Is that why we have all the riots? Riots are nothing new. They rioted back 2,000 years ago because we want what's right. And so we'll riot. We'll do whatever we can. Everybody wants what's right. So if God brings justice, it's going to be a beautiful justice. And for God to be unjust would be unrighteous. So God just can't look at the world and go, oh, don't worry about it. Because that's kind of how people think about God. Oh, don't worry about it. It's going to be all fine. We're going to work it out. Without justice, it doesn't pass the 2L test, logical and livable. Everybody wants justice. That makes sense. And we can't live without it. So I tell you what, we'll riot because we can't live without it. See, so God brings justice. It passes the 2L test. It's very logical, and it is very livable, because now we have new life through his justice. You can't get any better. The price has been paid. Now we'll get to the end of Genesis 3 then, verse 22. Um, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. In other words, They're taking our, you know, God is saying, now they're deciding what is right and wrong. They're they're their own gods, little g. Something's happened. It's called the fall. So he must not be allowed to reach and take out his hand and take from the fruit of the tree of life and live forever. In other words, you've lost the, the, the right to live forever. They can't take that tree anymore. And that's what that tree stood for. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which they had been taken. He drove the man out, and he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim. Now, cherubim are angels, and their whole job, you can read this through the Bible in different places, is to protect God's holiness. It's a barrier that humans can't get to, because if we get to God's holiness, when we're unholy, we'll perish. So it not only shows how holy God is, but it also protects us from dying eternally, by approaching God's holiness. So these cherubim wings are there. And you can see this in the New Testament all over the place. But anyway, especially in the book of Revelation. The Garden of Eden cherubim had flaming swords flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. I'm worn out. We've gone through three chapters right here. But it's so important to know these three chapters. 
because it's reality. So um, <clears throat> we need to maybe take that chart and go over, you know, go read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 ten times all at once and use that chart to know those several dozen truths. Now we'll know why then also that this world is covered in religions. This whole world is covered in religions because naturally we know we can't make it to God without some kind of a re religious act. It's called self justification. God has pulled the plug on life for us. So we need to understand these three chapters of Genesis. So Jesus, and we know that the offspring of the woman in Genesis 3, 15, will crush Satan's head. When Jesus came, we call it Christmas, don't we? Christ. Christmas. And many don't even know why we have Christmas. Uh, even Joseph and Mary didn't know, right? They didn't know. So God sent angels to explain to Joseph and Mary what would happen. And why would we have Christmas? For Christmas parties? For presents? For days off of work? I loved it at school because you got two weeks off, my favorite holiday of all besides summer and Easter. But uh, for candy, is that why you have Christmas? No, here's what the angel said. You will call him Yeshua, which means Yahweh, the I am. Yahweh saves. And what will he save us from? Our sins. That goes all the way back to Genesis 3, doesn't it? It's our sins that keep us separated from God. So the whole purpose of Christmas is so that Jesus will come and save us from our sins. We're all born in Adam. We could all say, I know this phrase is very popular today, I'm just born that way. Born that way. We're all born lost. Every human being is born in sin. <clears throat> now I'm going to close with a couple of New Testament scriptures. I want to look at John chapter 3 first. Then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes up to Jesus. Now Nicodemus is a, is a great man. He's a learned man. He's a holy man. And he says, Jesus, how... He gave him this great greeting, and Jesus interrupted him and said this to Nicodemus. This is in the beginning of, I think it's verse 4 in chapter 3. Nicodemus, you'll never see the kingdom of God. No one sees the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In other words, we're all born naturally in Adam, correct? Now we must be reborn in Christ. And that's what he's saying right there. Jesus is saying this. Of course, Nicodemus takes it naturally. He goes, how can I enter my mother's womb and be born a second time? It makes no sense. And then Jesus re-explains it. And that happens all through the New Testament. Something is not understood, and then it is re-explained in another way. It gives us a deeper understanding. Now we'll just jump to John 3.16, and we all know this verse. God so loved the world. That means everybody. doesn't matter what race. doesn't matter you know, how much money you have. God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son. The one and only means monogenes, the only kind. He's the only holy one. One and only son. That whoever believes, that's anyone, any race, whoever believes in him, puts their trust in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. No, he didn't come to condemn the world. What did he come for? To save the world. That's what it says right here. To save it through him. Now look what the next verse says. Verse 18. Don't miss this. Whoever believes, in other words, trusts, says yes. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. But whoever has not believed, what's their status? Already condemned. Their stance in this world is condemned already. So we need to understand this, the entire both sides of the reality of justice. Justice is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And, and love and justice meet at the cross. Now we'll go over to 1 Corinthians 15, which is called the resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 is so long, we can't read the whole thing, but I want to look at two parts. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection. What are we resurrected from? From being dead in sin. From being dead in sin. The resurrection chapter. Jesus starts the resurrection, right? And then we follow him. 
Look what it says in verse 20 then. People are wondering about the resurrection. Can it really happen in, in 1 Corinthians 15? It's of course it has happened. There's been many witnesses, and they're all listed here. So verse 20 starts out like this. Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, fallen asleep means those who have died. First fruits in Hebrew means they had seven feasts. The first feast was Passover. After three days was the feast of first fruits. You can go back and see that all through the Old Testament. The third day, the priest would go out and wave a harvest as a prayer before the Lord. Lord, bring a future harvest for us. And that would be the feast of first fruits. And then they'd put that down. That first week would be over with. <clears throat> you'd have the Feast of Tabernacles. Or not the Feast of Tabernacles, but... Um, <clears throat> then after seven weeks, they start the harvest. So that first fruits was pointing to the, when the harvest starts. And so that's why it says, Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits, the first of those who have been risen. There'll be others following him. And that's what it means here. Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, didn't it come through Adam? Genesis 3. Death came through a man. The resurrection of the dead also will come through a man. Wow. Jesus came to be the second Adam. We will follow him. That's what it's saying right here. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. What a pattern we have here. Then it goes on to say, each to his own turn. Now he's going to talk about the second coming of Christ right here. First, Christ is the first fruits. He rose again. He's the, prom he's the first fruits, the promise of a future harvest. He rose after Passover on what day? How many days? Third day. That's the first fruits. Fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of first fruits. A promise, future harvest. Let's see, verse uh, 23. Each to his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, the second coming, those who belong to him will, will be either in the grave or alive on this earth. We're going to go and be with him. Then the end will come. He's talking about the end of the age now. Then the end will come. This is verse 24. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion. Remember, he's king of kings, right? After he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. There's no higher authority than Jesus, the risen Lord. Now look at verse 25 says, for he must reign. He's the king. Doesn't he reign in our hearts right now? Praise God he does. I'm glad he does. He must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. And look what the last enemy is in this next verse. The last enemy to be destroyed is what? Death. I know the world likes to say death is our friend. They want everybody to feel good about it. No, death's an enemy. It entered into Genesis 3 in an enemy from enemy territory. It was never planned for God. God wants us to live forever. So death's an enemy that will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. There'll be no more dead. All you got to do is read Revelation 22, uh, 21 and 22. You'll see it all. But now let's go to the end of this little chapter, 54, because we're going to celebrate as we get to the end of this. <laughs> When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable. Now, who will, who will be clothed in imperishable clothing? You and me at the end of the age. We're going to get a new body, correct? When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, the saying that is written will come true. This is the truth. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And that's a quote from Isaiah 25. And then whenever anyone conquers, the, the conquering people must taunt the loser. That goes all over natural world history. You taunt the loser. And this is a taunt. It's a quote from Hosea, uh, chapter 12, I believe it is. <clears throat> or, yeah, chapter 13. Where, O death, is your victory? This is God taunting death. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? In other words, death, you've lost I have won. And how do you win? You win through Christ. Isn't that amazing? Didn't he win on the cross? Goes to the grave. He rose again. He won. Now we win with him. Then it says this in verse 56. The sting of death is sin. Remember Genesis 3? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. The law keeps condemning us, and people want to stay away from it. But if you bow to Jesus... The law suddenly comes into our heart and we want to serve him. And the law is a good thing. 
And we're innocent because we're covered in him now, a whole new covering. The sting of death is sin, and we all feel it. And the power of, of the sin is the law, and everybody wants to stay away from it. Verse 57, however, verse 57, thanks be to God. I want to back up just a minute. There can't be anything more scary than verse 56 to this world. The sting of death is sin. Oh, it stings, and it's killing us, but we can't talk about it. We can't mention it. And the power of sin is the law. God's law just really makes it even worse. But once you bow, we can say verse 57. Thanks be to God. He gives all of us victory through whom? Jesus Christ. Not ourselves. No wonder we worship Jesus. No wonder we pray to him. No wonder we serve him. That's what worship means, to put somebody first. Worth, worth scribed. Worth scribed. We're scribing worth to him, and we're serving him first. So verse 58 then gives us a therefore. Because of all that's done, therefore, here's what we do. My dear brothers and sisters, because we're, we're, we belong to God's family now, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So you go through Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Every problem on the face of this earth is because of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. But we also see the answer, and the answer is in Christ. The answer is in Christ. Praise God for that. It's a reality, reality today. <clears throat> and the end is only going to come in two ways for anyone. First, somebody's going to die, or Jesus will come back. One of those two ways, there'll be an end. But if you belong to Jesus, you start celebrating right now. We want to pray that in our nation, we have a revival. We need a revival across this land that more and more people will come to know Jesus. The truth of the gospel is in here so powerfully as we read his word. And uh, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 really reveal God's salvation history that has been moving on. But one day that history will be over. Either the person dies or Jesus comes back. But God wants that salvation history deep in all of our hearts. God so loved everyone that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes, as long as they have a breath, the thief on the cross barely had a breath left, but he believed he only had a few seconds left. But whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for the truth in these three chapters of Genesis. Help us to reread these, reread these many times with these points Maybe a couple dozen points we can always refer to. And we pray for a revival across the land in the United States of America. And it might even go to other lands as well. We pray for the miracle of your grace that more and more will believe. So much that the news media will even have to report it. And they will report the truth, your truth. Let that truth live in us and be with us more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.